All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gabrowski, and I'll be your host for today. January is a great month. We just started our events for the new year this week, and we've already, I think, have something like 25, 30 live events coming your way this month. So we hope to see everybody joining us, whether you're at home learning virtually or you are lucky enough to be in the classroom. You can check out exploringbytheseat.com and find all the events that we have coming up. So one of our themes in January is polar exploration. We're connecting with scientists, explorers, and conservationists uh, who explore the polar regions of our planet, uh, the North, the South Pole, the Arctic, the Antarctic. And as many of you may already know, these areas are in trouble. They're under threat due to global warming. So these areas are warming at a rate of twice that of the rest of the planet. And so we're really lucky to be connecting to so many researchers and scientists who are studying the problem and spreading the word about what's happening. And of course, uh, the amazing biodiversity that you can find in these regions uh, is also great to learn about as well. So joining us today, I'm so excited to have Paul Rose joining us. Paul is at the front line of exploration. He's one of the world's most experienced divers, field scientists, and polar experts. He helps scientists unlock and communicate global mysteries in the most remote and challenging regions of our planet. He's currently the expedition leader for National Geographic Pristine Seas, and he has tons of experience uh, in the polar regions, particularly in Antarctica. He was a base commander of Rothra Research Station uh, in Antarctica for 10 years with the British Antarctic Survey. He was awarded the Queen's Polar Medal, also for his work with NASA and the Mars Lander Project on Mount Erebus, uh, he was received the U.S. Polar Medal. So let's bring Paul in with us live from Switzerland. Hey, Paul, how are we doing today? Hey, Joe, great to see you again, and hello, everybody. It's great to be back running alongside you, Joe. Always a favorite moment in my life. <laughs> All right, Paul. Well, as always, it's great to see your face. It's great to have you joining us live. We have a great group of classrooms across North America. Uh, some of them are on camera with us, a whole bunch more tuning in live via YouTube. So I want to give them a quick shout out right now and just remind them you can use that chat sidebar. Let us know where you're watching from. Uh, we're thrilled to have you joining us, but then save that chat for questions. We don't want to have to mute anybody today. So keep the chat open for questions after you've had a chance to introduce yourself and let us know uh, where you're joining us from. So Paul, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit and then I have a feeling we're going to have a lot of questions today. Yeah, great. Well, thanks a lot, Joe. And hello, everybody. Thanks for letting me join you today and speak about the polar regions. It's uh, my heart is in the cold places. It really is. I do all right in the warm places and I love being at sea. But there is something about the beauty of the polar regions that they're, they're completely different from anywhere else. And I think it's the sense of space. It's not very colorful. So I find it very restful. It's either white or dark or different shades of black and gray and silver and blue. And I just love that simple scenery and sense of space and vastness, expanse and the general sense of the it's it's unexplored. And it really speaks to me. I love to be in the polar region. So thank you for letting me join you and to share some polar um, well, some 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 polar work with you i think that'd be that'd be lovely so hang on let me just share my screen with you take me two seconds so here we go i'm paul rosen you know here i am underwater which is where most people see me from because that's my great love i love the polar regions and i love the ocean these are the two large expanses on the planet that really ring with me and as Joe kindly said, I'm the expedition leader for National Geographic Pristine Seas. You can see we've been busy. We've had 31 expeditions. We've protected over 6 million square kilometers of the ocean. And when you think there isn't much more than 6 million square kilometers protected, so you can see how busy and effective we are. And we've done that by helping to create 24 
marine reserves. And But for me, when I think about the ocean and the vast spaces, and I think about the polar regions, I always come back to this image. You know, imagine what it's like to get some old photographs, put them all together on a completely unmapped area, and have a look at what possible route that might be, and convert that into an actual journey. Like crossing the Greenland ice cap, um, I lead Greenland ice cap expeditions, which is right up my street. It's it's thirty days. It's in many ways it's a mindless physical grunt that only just works, and it's right up my street. It's a beautiful, beautiful journey. At the start of the trip, you're at the coast on the east side, recreating Nansen's old route, and of course it's uphill. The snow's quite warm and heavy. And the sledges are as heavy as they're going to be. So the first few days are really tough. But after a few weeks and you begin to eat a bit of food and you get on the top, which is colder and the surfaces are better and the sledges are lighter and you start going down the other side, it just fits. It's a beautiful, beautiful journey. And it's always good on those journeys to remember when you first looked at the map and saw what was possible. Or here in Canud Rasmussen Land in Greenland, where you saw that image of the photographs there where I led an expedition, a brand new route, 300 kilometers through Knud Rasmussen land, where all these glaciers and all these peaks were untraveled, unnamed and unsurveyed. And so it's an amazing experience to travel through them and sense that freshness and sense of the unexplored. And even climbing the high mountains in Greenland, here we are approaching the summit of Gumbion Field, which is the highest in the Arctic. And when you look at those peaks in the distance, it's, you know, you know, exciting to know that about 80% of what you're seeing there is unnamed, unclimbed, unmapped, or even unsurveyed. So as well as looking at maps and finding great, exciting places to go, I can use the same skill with science. It's a beautiful thing, you know, to, to meet scientists such as my great friend here, Jeff Severinghouse from Scripps. And that bit of paper he's got there is actually one great, big, massive, hugely complex equation that I couldn't begin to understand. And it's Jeff explaining to me how and why we're going to collect ancient methane from 11,000 year old ice to see what part methane played in climate change 11,000 years ago, and therefore what part it might be playing now. So I meet people like Jeff and scientists all over the world who have these really big, ambitious science hypotheses, science ideas, and I convert them into remote, beautiful camps like this one in Antarctica, on the American side of Antarctica, in the dry valleys, or here at the South Pole. Ah, yep. And or using, you know, remote, re remotely operate um, in getting in the remote regions by twin ship and helicopter operations, aircraft, big ones and small ones. The one at the top left, left is the one that we use from the Falkland Islands down to my old base in Antarctica as an air bridge. That's a Dash 7 that we use on wheels, both on, on ice and on the runway there. The one at the bottom left is a Twin Otter which is, you know, it's the pickup truck. It's the workhorse of remote operations, isn't it? Both in polar regions and in remote areas all over the world. Or even on the right-hand side, you can see we're using a ski-equipped C-130 Hercules. It's an exciting business when one of them comes into your camp. And using all of those tools to take that science hypothesis and a load of equipment and deliver something at a research base like my old one here, Rothra, which... I have to say that's a that's one of those um, you know long shots. The runway isn't really bent; it's a one kilometer long straight runway, and the panoramic shot always makes it look a little bit bent. But when I take that science and convert it into research stations and camps and ships and and helicopters, um, I have to bear in mind that we're there to do the science. It is exciting, it is interesting, and it is demanding and all the rest of it, and it is adventurous. But we're there to do the science, so that means setting up camps like this, which which is a, a camp on the left hand side, you can see a big silver tank. And that is a 1 million BTU melter that we take ancient ice in and melt it down under a vacuum, draw off the gases and extract the methane component from it. And in that orange tent is a gas 
chromatograph machine where we can analyze it. And there, here's the very simple version that we first took up to Greenland. You can see very challenging conditions. We couldn't keep anything straight on that expedition. There's the 1 million BTU melter in the front. And to fill it, uh, we, spent, we spent three months at a time digging ice in the right spot and popping it into that melter to draw off the right gases. Something that always falls into my plate because I run something called science support. You know, I take those big science hypotheses and turn them into practical camps and practical application in the field is the waste management. Here in, you know, if you like non-expedition life, the waste management is sort of all done for us, isn't it? We take the, the bottles and the cans and the paper and the plastic to the right place and it gets done for us. And it can seem a bit remote, but on an expedition like this in very pristine areas, we can't afford to leave one speck of rubbish or waste behind. So that means every week or so, I get it all organized and helicopter comes in and takes it out. So you can see me standing there with about 10 days worth of waste on another project in the Taylor Glacier. On the left-hand side of that big sledge, um, you can see uh, a whole bunch of plastic and bottles and cardboard ready. And on the right-hand side, you can see those gray drums. And in those gray drums is human waste. Uh, so there's a couple of drums that are human waste, solid waste, and a couple of drums that are pee. We can't afford to leave anything behind. So it really sharpens the mind of the importance of waste management. I also use polar skills and analyzing and making science projects work for television. You've probably heard that in the Arctic, things are changing fast. It really is melting very quickly. In fact, in a, around about to, uh, 2040, there won't be any more multi-year ice in the Antarctic, except for one place called the Last Ice, which is the north eastern tip of Greenland and the northwestern tip of Canada, the Last Ice. And that place will be a bit like the Serengeti. That's where the whales and the polar bears will gravitate towards. The rest of the uh, Arctic sea ice will be about like you see there with the with the ship. It will be this more open water. And you've, you must have already heard that there are many, many shipping routes that now travel through the Arctic and that will increase. Well, to describe that for television, when I stand in front of a green screen or sit in a studio, it's never very exciting because people are just hearing me talk about it. But the way to do it for BBC was to go up there on this ship and dive under the ice where it was just single year ice and then find these enormous icebergs that are about the size of cities and they are multi-year ice where Bergen flows have captured on top of each other and they become absolutely massive complex things and I dived inside the caves formed by those multi-year ice flows and of course when I'm diving in those caves in the ice very close to the North Pole. In fact, the picture is at the North Pole. You've got, we hope anyway, some of the audience going, wow, that looks terrific. Maybe half the audience are going, oh, I'd never do that. But at least they're listening to someone talk about the importance of understanding what's happening to the Arctic sea ice. Um, and as I said, it's the diving that, that, that really fires me up on these big projects. So even in Antarctica, I would jump at the opportunity to diving. For some years, I was also the diving officer for the British Antarctic Survey. It's me on the bottom left there, and the man on the right with the green bucket is Lloyd Peck, a very famous marine scientist. And we're working on a project of his where he's studying limpets to tell the climate change story. Limpets grow their shells a little bit like tree, like tree growth. You know, there's sort of rings on them, and you can see how fast or how slow they've grown at certain years. So it's an amazing project to swim around in those beautiful Antarctic waters, swim around collecting limpets, which isn't that exciting. Bearing in mind, every time you put your head underwater in Antarctica, you hear whales. So you're swimming around, picking up limpets, listening to whale song. For Pristine Seas, National Geographic, our project, we have worked, we've been busy in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. And in fact, my first Pristine Seas expedition was to here, Franz Josef Land, the most northerly archipelago in the world. It's in Russian waters, and Russia had an intention to 
create the first uh, Arctic marine protected area. So we went up, supported them, did the science, made the film. And you might imagine the experiences we had. We, we had a lot of experiences with polar bears, lots of amazing stories with, with melting ice and the filming the underwater life and the surprising amount of life that exists in minus one water. And of course, walruses. We, we had a lot of fun with walruses. Um, and just so you know, we took this picture using a pole camera so you can float in a small zodiac and make good use of time by having a camera down and swinging it around underwater and capturing these beautiful, very curious walruses. I should tell you too that we did have great plans to dive alongside the walruses, but it turns out that none of us were brave enough because they're very curious, very, very, very big and pushy with their sort of territorial approach. And in the end, none of us were brave enough to 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 jump in the water with them. So we did all the filming of of walruses using what they call pole cameras. And I think you'll agree with me, the images are absolutely uh, beautiful. Again, on Pristine Seas, we were lucky. Um, I led the expedition for a film called Last Ice, which we recently won the Emmy for, which I'm very pleased with. Of course, terrific film to tell that story of the way the ice is moving and that the last ice really will be up there in northwest, northeast Greenland, northwest Canada. Um, and to tell that story, we went at the start of the ice melt because the Arctic Spring is one of the most powerful releases of energy imaginable. You know, it's been locked up for the whole winter. As Soon as it begins to warm, the ice begins to ease a little bit, making room for these enormous icebergs that have become unstable because of wind erosion to roll around. As they roll around, the ice becomes more broken. And in those broken gaps, here come the narwhals, you know, the whales with the big, long, single tusks. And as they come along and breathe up in the gaps as they hunt for fish, they make tons of noise. And the seals can't communicate by clicking properly. So they pop out of the ice and the polar bears say, thank you very much. So they have their feed. Plus, of course, as the ice melts off of the cliffs and the tundra comes alive and millions of birds begin to breed, it is a truly life-enhancing experience to be there at spring. But um, with all that life going on, you do bump into, we, we did have some experiences that made us jump, particularly me when, when that isn't me, by the way, but I did have a, a polar bear jump on me while I was in my tent uh, asleep. I was there half sleeping with, with no clothes on on a glorious 24-hour daylight night. It was about two in the morning and a bear jumped on me, mistaking my snow-covered tent for a snow mound because at that time of year, behind sort of every every other snow mound is a seal pup, which the bear can eat. Jumped and all, all its sharp bits missed me, but sort of this part of its right foreleg caught me and squashed me into the ground. And I jumped out of the tent, jumped, jumped out my sleeping bag, of course, and just sat there naked and wondered where he was. And he ended up walking around the tent for 45 minutes and disappearing. So we... We kept it a bit quiet. We didn't want to make a big drama of it. So I was very surprised to get back to England and find myself on the front page of um, some of the newspapers by this great cartoonist uh, making a joke out of the uh, poor old polar bear being traumatized because I happened to be naked um, in the tent at two in the morning. So so there you go. That's this. That's my story of a of, of brief, fast story of running through the polar work. I like to finish, I'm often asked, because I work with these amazing photographers at National Geographic, what's your favorite picture? And I always show them this one, because this is me on the last dive in the Arctic, uh, on the last ice project, with our bear dog, who was so excited to see me come up after the last dive, because we loved each other, that he bit me on the head and hung on to me for ages. So I thought it was interesting that I didn't get bitten polar, by the polar bear, but I do have a good old scar here on the left-hand side of my head from my own bear dog. So there you go. Thanks very much indeed. It's great to join you. And I'm, I'm standing by for your comments, uh, guidance, and even advice. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, Paul. Well, thank you so much for another great presentation. It's, you know, incredible work you've done leading science 
in these, these remote regions, getting the information in, making sure the area stays pristine. Uh, and speaking of pristine, the work you've done with pristine seas and, you know, particularly up in Franz Josef land to try and get these marine protected areas uh, up and running is, is just incredible. So thanks for sharing that with us today, Paul. You're very welcome. It's great to be here. All right. Well, a couple of things I want to share before we jump into the Q&A. The first thing is, uh, you know, there's so many students joining us today. We'll never get to all of uh, the questions. So we've started doing Padlets after the event. So for about a day after today's event, we'll keep the Padlet open. And if we don't get a chance to answer your question, you can send it in here. And I'll share that link with those who signed up for the event as well. Uh, and then in a couple of days, Paul will take a look and he'll answer some of those questions for you. So um, we know we won't get to everybody, but we want to make sure uh, that your questions get answered. Paul, we started something new here. Uh, I don't think you've done an event with us since we've been using Kahoot. So we've been doing Kahoot quizzes during the event uh, to see how well classrooms have been paying attention. So we're going to dive into one. I put one together while you were presenting. So we're going to jump into one before we do our Q&A action. Great. So for those who are with us, whether you're at home or in the classroom, uh, you can head to kahoot.com. Uh, Actually, it's a little easier. Uh, let me just edit this link really quickly here. This one works well as well, kahoot.it. So I'm gonna put that up there. And that should bring you to Kahoot. Uh, and I'm gonna share my screen and show you the pin number for joining. So if you have your own device, you can join independently. If not, your, your teacher, he, uh, he or she can join at the front of the room and you guys can shout out your answers. So here we go. Let's get into our Kahoot. All right, so there is your pin number right there. 573-5127. Uh, uh, if you wanna pop that in, I should see you joining shortly. We'll let a few players come in and join us and we'll see who comes out on top. And there we go, we've got our first uh, students starting to join us now. So we'll just give a minute here, Paul, we'll see how many students come and join us. Uh, That's and right. then we'll, we'll see who comes out uh, on top. All right, a great crew joining already, Paul. We're already up over 75. Let's give it another maybe 30 seconds and see if we push up over 100 students here. <laughs> We've got some great names like Polar Bear and some of the students' names. I see a few teachers' names who are joining, representing their classroom. All right. This is great, I like it. So just a reminder that there's gonna be four questions, multiple choice. 20 seconds for each question. Uh, if you get the right answer, you get points. If you answer really quickly, you get even more points. Uh, and then if you get the answer wrong, but you do it really fast, I'm sorry, we've got nothing for you. Uh, you've got to get it right. And the quicker, the better. I even see a name here, Paul is cool, Paul. So I think uh, maybe that's about just you in general, or maybe when you're in the polar regions, that's how you feel. <laughs> All right, like awesome it. stuff. Well, we're almost at 200 students, but I'm gonna take things live, so here we go. So first question coming up, remember 20 seconds for each question, try and answer that question nice and quick. Here we go, which base in Antarctica was Paul in command of? Was it Palmer, was it McMurdo, was it Rothra, uh, or was it Scott? All right, most of the students went with Rothra. Good job. Uh, let's see how we are doing here. All right, Nick is in first place, but everything is pretty close. So let's jump into our next question and see how that shifts our leaderboard. Where is the highest peak in the Arctic? Did Paul say it was in Canada, Iceland, Greenland, or Svalbard? All 
All right. Most students went to Greenland. Good job, crew. How does that change our board? Nick is holding down the lead, but some movement down below. Let's jump up to question three and see what happens. Um, when are we projected to lose multi-year ice in the Arctic? Is it 2030, 2040, 2050, or 2060? Answers coming in nice and fast. They've been pretty sharp so far, Paul. I like it. I was just, I'm so impressed. I'm looking at it. Everyone's, everyone's pretty sharp. They're on the ball. All right. About 100 students went with 2040. That's absolutely correct. And here we go. Let's see how that changed our board. Nick, Nick is, might hold it wire to wire, but uh, he's got some competition right behind him. Anything can happen uh, with our final question. So here we go. Where did Paul see the walrus while working to create a new marine protected area? Was it Baffin Island in Canada? Was it Norway? Was it Greenland? Or was it Franz Joseph Land? Really thinking about all these Arctic places, Paul. I love it. All right. Narrowly, we had Franz Joseph Land, which is correct. Good stuff. Yay. And let's see where our final leaderboard shakes out before we go to some Q&A action. No Team Krinsky ended up in third. Colin holding down second spot. And Derek sneaking in at the end to take first place. All right. Good job, crew. Great to have you joining us for some Kahoot action. Uh, let me shut that down here. And I think it's time to get into that Q&A action. So uh, if you're joining us live via YouTube, send your questions in via the chat. We'll work some of those in. But for now, let's get started with some of our camera classroom. So I'm going to start us off. I'm going to take us to, uh, there we go. Let's go to um, Miss Quigley's crew. They are hanging out with us in Ontario here in Canada. Looks like some grade five and six students. Let's bring them front and center for us. There we go. Hey, Mr. Quigley, how are you doing? Great, thanks. What a wonderful presentation. We're really enjoying it. Thank so you. I'm just looking in our um, classroom chat here, and we have uh, one of the first questions was, what type of equipment do you find is most important to keep you warm when you're on your expeditions? That's a, that's a really great question. And you know what's really funny, a lot of people find this funny, is I'm never so cold as when I'm in a city or an urban area. Because, you know, we often find ourselves going to a business meeting or, you know, going to a school or somewhere where we want to look maybe smart and not very practical. And I'm often freezing in the, in the cities, whereas when we're in the polar regions, we're always wearing the great expedition kit. And so it's a mixture of stuff. We don't just want to wear one big heavy thing because then we can't adjust it. You're either really cold or really hot. So we tend to layer up, you know, wear a really good thin base layer and then a slightly thicker medium layer and then an insulation layer. And then if it's wet, you need a rain jacket. If it's not wet, you just need, say, a good down coat and hats and gloves and all that. So it's this combination of layers. But as I spend most of my life in the sea, then it has to be a good dry suit. You know, in the old days, we always used to dive under the ice in a wetsuit. In fact, the great man Joe Grabowski there, he still ice dives in a wetsuit. So he's still a real hero. Whereas those of us that have, you know, progressed on, we're happy to wear our dry suits because in a dry suit, it has a really lovely good neck seal and wrist seal, dry gloves, dry boots. It's thick. You can put air in it that comes in from your scuba tank. And underneath the suit, you can wear really good polar cold underwear. So it looks as if it's, you know, going to be a cold dive. But in fact, it's a really warm dive. And on the on the rack behind me there, I've even got one of these heated vests with a whopping great battery. So not only are we warm and dry, but in on really cold long dives, we can plug in to a warm vest. So there you go. I suppose if I had to pick it, it would be that wonderful dry suit. All right. Fair enough, Paul. Uh, yes, the dry suits. One day I'll get there. 
Uh, but for now, the wetsuits are working. And I find yeah, man, Joe. <laughs> in the water, I'm having so much fun. I don't notice. It's when I get out. Then I yeah. get really cold. But yeah, yeah, we'll get to the dry suit one day. Uh, all right. Let's see here. Miss Nicholson, seventh and eighth graders are joining us. They are in Manitoba. Let's bring uh, into the call here. Hey, Miss Nicholson, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm good. Thank you for that. Uh, one question that came up was how long have you been doing this and then what actually got you started on this career oh yeah well i've been doing it most of my life it's a lovely question thank you for it um when i was when i was a kid i was not very good in school um uh had a lot of trouble sitting at the desk just couldn't sit at the desk and the, the books were were dense to me i wasn't a good reader and i wasn't i, I guess i as a kid i never really learned enough to learn and um, all I wanted to do was to be out. So what got me started was watching television and watching my great heroes, uh, Hans and Lottie Huss and Jacques Cousteau, do their underwater explorations. And then a, a geography teacher taking, taking us in school out to the Brecon Beacons, which is on the Welsh-English border, and doing you know what we think of these days as an outward bound course. And I loved it, you know, working outdoors and understanding safe climbing routes and safe paddling routes and how to how to camp in bad weather and all that stuff. And I absolutely loved it. So that got me started. And I've been doing I then went and did a apprenticeship at Ford Motor Company as a tool maker. And that meant I had some money and got me started with some kind of career where I could become a professional diver and then a mountain guide. And from that. I went into science support. So for most of my life, I've I've done this. And for the other part of my life, when I was a kid, I was trying to do it. <laughs> All right, great question. Thank you so much for that question from our crew in Manitoba. I'm gonna grab uh, two quick ones here from you two, Paul. I'm gonna combine them. So the first one, Miss Erickson's crew is joining us in the US and they're wondering, uh, how would you compare size-wise a walrus to a human? And then we also have uh, a class joining us in Georgetown. Looks like 100 students tuning in with us right now. And they're wondering if you have a favorite place to work in the polar regions. Great. Well, yeah, walruses are big. Um, when we see them on television or film or on images, they just look big, but we can't see them and feel them and sort of touch them and, and sense their presence very much, can we? But they're absolutely enormous. I've been with them a lot in, in, in the Arctic. Um, but never dive with them. Uh, the fear, of course, is that they're, they're so big and they're not what you call aggressive, but they're very territorial, especially when they've got young ones. And with the big tusks, they could probably accidentally hook onto us and hold us down on the bottom for a long time. They weigh about 2,000 pounds. So that's a lot bigger than a human. You know, that's, you know, it's a, it's a vast weight. And what's interesting is they've got big heads, their eyes are red, and they come very close to the boat. And in fact, they're very curious. So when they're up looking around the boat, and they're looking and they're coming up and down like that, their two great big tusks occasionally have popped our boat, our inflatable boat. So it isn't aggression, it's just curiosity and territorial behavior. But wow, these are big, whopping, great things. So we so we treat them with with a, a lot of respect. Um, and the other question was my favorite place to work. Was that favorite place to work anywhere, Joe, or favorite place in Antarctica? Uh, polar region. Is there somewhere in the polar region that you'd love to be? Oh, yeah. Can I have two? Sure, <laughs> absolutely. It's the Greenland ice cap because it's such a beautiful, committing journey. It is very simple. You just have to keep skiing for a month, but the loads are heavy as I described. And it's a wonderful thing to, to make that straight line across Greenland for a whole month, thinking about the early explorers like Nansen. And then in Antarctica, it has to be the peninsula because the Antarctic Peninsula is very accessible. It's quite geographically compact. So it changes all the time. So with a bit of effort, you can go from the sense of the of the polar continent to very tight sort of alpine type peaks or fjord land full of whales 
and tons of ice and birds. So really, it's the, yeah, Greenland ice cap and the Antarctic Peninsula. Great question. All right, let's bring in another camera class here. Let's go to Maine this time. We've got Miss Whipple's crew hanging out with us, some fourth graders. Let's bring them in. How are we doing, fourth graders? Good. Good. My name is Cole, and I have a question. What is what is your favorite animal out of the animals that you've seen? Ah, favorite animal. That's a lovely. Hey, thank you very much for for such a great question. I really like the clownfish. The clownfish are great. Um, you've seen them on Finding Nemo. These beautiful little striped fish that sort of live in and amongst the anemones because they are they're small, beautiful fish. They have a great life, a really great life. You know, the anemones can be quite poisonous and the fish just hides back in there. And he's just having this really good, I've always liked the clownfish, you know. I look at whales and sharks and dolphins and bears of all kinds and, and wolves and birds of everything. But I always think back to that clownfish and I, 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 would, I could see myself being a pretty good clownfish. I'd have a lot of fun. All right. Very cool. I've known you a while, Paul, and that was an unexpected answer. So very cool. <laughs> Good to know. Paul the Clownfish. All right. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, very cool. Awesome. Uh, we're going to got another camera crew here joining us. This is Miss Elliot's crew. They are in Dallas, Texas, some sixth graders. So I'm going to bring them in here. Or sorry, seventh graders. Hey, seventh grade. How are we doing? All right. And this is our first event today. So it's great to have you hanging out with us. Uh, and we're looking forward to a question. Okay. Hi, my name is Audrey. And my question is, what are a few items you always make sure to have when you go exploring? Oh, thank you. Uh, I just want to make sure I've got it right. What are the items that I always have with me when I go exploring? Yes. That's it. Yeah. Well, one of the first things I have is a really good set of earplugs because you know expeditions can be noisy and in the polar regions in the summer where it's 24 hour daylight you can have helicopters coming and going and all kinds of work going on generators running you name it, it can be noisy so to get a good sleep i always tell everybody to bring a really great set of earplugs so if your tent happens to be downwind of some generators running or helicopters that are coming in during the middle of your sleep time, you can get a really, really good sleep. And another one is you really have to take a lot of underwear, not just the ordinary underwear that you wear, but your thin first layer, you know, your long bottoms and your, and your nice thin top, because you can't really wash them up there or down there. You can wash, you know, do a bit of sun washing, give them a good rub in the snow and hang them out. But it's really lovely to put on that clean, fresh stuff you can't do it every day, but every couple of weeks to put on that nice clean underwear and fresh shirt. Wow. It just feels so great. And it's more effective because when it's clean, it works better. And let's face it, it's also a bit friendlier to your tent mates. So, yep, plenty of underwear and your earplugs. All right. Good stuff, Paul. Good advice, I think, in lots of situations, but definitely good uh, on expedition as well. <laughs> So, Paul, there's a great question here online, and I, I think it's it's you can definitely see that the classrooms are thinking here. So, Miss Spicer's crew wants to know how do you balance the emissions and impact from you know bringing a lot of gear and planes and helicopters in in these areas like the Antarctic and the Arctic? Well, this is a lovely question. Thanks for it, and it's something that's always on our minds. We have to conduct an audit you know what is going to be our impact on the region we're going to compared to the benefit that we hope to get now partly that's that's managed by the permit system particularly in the antarctic the antarctic permit system is managed to the antarctic treaty regulations which is a very successful international treaty um, and it works well the Ant antarctica is beautifully protected uh, the land for sure and the sea is becoming more protected and so it means that they're very very tight regulations um, about who can go how you can go how you can travel you can't leave anything behind and what you're going to do there in the arctic it's less control but each country has its own permit system 
But there we are especially careful to do our own, what we call a sustainability audit. You know, we're, we're there, we're helping the uh, government leaders and politicians to create large protected areas. So to do that, we need to fill in the scientific gaps because there's a lot known about some of these regions, but often not enough to carry the decision to get it protected. So we do the science. Now, to do the science, we need to get up there and we need team with teams with a bunch of gear and all that. But then not everybody is motivated by the beautiful science report. So to tell the story, we make a film. And that film then is easy for everybody, uh, not just politicians and influencers, but the whole of the population to understand the beauty of their region. So we're very, very careful and for that. And rest assured that for every single expedition we do, we do that sustainability balance. And it's got to be in favour. If it was the other way around, we wouldn't go. All right. Good stuff. And a great question from Miss Spicer's crew. Thank you. I want to bring in Miss Krinsky's class, fourth graders in Ontario and Maple. Oh my God, it's How are you doing today? We're doing really great. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, so much. We've learned so much from you. So exciting. Um, our questions, we have a ton of questions, but specifically I wrote for you that my class asked, very important, the food situation. They'd like to know what do you and the crew eat yeah, she's in the show. when you are exploring? And the second question we have is, have you noticed cool. the effects of yeah. climate change over the course of so, your career? So Paul and Joe. Two great questions. Thanks very much. Yeah, well, the, most importantly, what do we eat? Well, we eat a lot of food. <laughs> when it's cold, you know, you do, you do want to eat a lot. Now, on the mobile traveling um, explorations that I showed the images of, like the Greenland ice cap and the climbing and, and lightweight trips, we can't take loads of heavy food. So we use very modern expedition food. And this stuff is great. You know, it's high calorie. It tastes great. And all you do... You melt some snow in the pan, get it to boiling water, rip off the top of the bag, pour it in the bag, stir it up, put it in your in your jacket or your sleeping bag for a few minutes, stir it up and eat it. And it tastes absolutely great. Really good expedition food. I remember when those expedition foods were pretty rough. There were only about, say, three flavors. Um, so if you're out for a number of months, Repeating the same meal every, every every three days is pretty rough. So, yes, the expedition foods these days are really, really good. The good ingredients, very healthy, very high calories. And we substitute that with, you know, cheese and sausage and snacks on the way and all that. And, and, and being British, a lot of tea. And for Americans, quite a lot of hot coffee and hot chocolate. So you want hot drinks and loads of high calorie food. Now, when we're on a research station, one of the Antarctic bases, I have to say the food is excellent because when we recruit, when we hire chefs to come in and work for us, we we always are lucky and we work hard to get the very best. And in fact, we eat so much when we're on the research stations, it's hard to keep the weight down. You find yourself out running and skiing and in the gym and everything, trying to keep your weight down when you're on the bases. So yes, so we eat everything that we can. <laughs> and then for the second question, which is climate change, that's one of the great questions that we always have, because in the polar regions, the effect of climate change is obvious. In, in cities and urban areas, it, you, could, you could look back many years and not see much difference between normal daily life, what you'd see out of the window in schools or offices or workplaces, to what it was, say, 30, 40 years ago and what it is today. But if you go to the polar regions where there isn't concrete car parks and buildings and highways and airports, then the effect is blindingly obvious. And we can see, and yes, you know, ice caps that I used to run science projects on are now open water where tourist ships drive through. And that's always a, a bit of a shock. And to fly over these areas that you remember as glaciers and ice caps and see just open water or bare rock is really quite a shock. So yes, I have seen a lot of that. And it's one of the great reasons to work in these in these areas. All right. Well, Paul, we're going to take uh, one more question here from YouTube uh, before we wrap up for today. I do want to share this link again here. So let me put it up there. Uh, 
you know, there's so many students joining and we want to make sure that classrooms get a chance to ask some of the questions that they want to ask. So if you visit the Padlet, you can put your questions in there after the event. We'll keep it open for about a day. Uh, and then we'll have Paul check it in a day or two uh, to answer some of those questions. And I will send this link as well uh, to those who registered for the event. Uh, so we'll make sure we get more of your questions in there for you. So jumping back to YouTube questions here, there's a classroom here, Ms. Hunter's crew, and they'd like to know about two pieces of equipment, if you use them or not. They want to know if you use quads, like ATVs, uh, when you're out, and also do you use snowshoes to walk on the snow sometimes? Yeah, lovely question. Yeah, we like the quads. Quads are awesome things. Mostly we use them on, on rocky, rocky ground, um, you know, where the glacier and ice have retreated and we've just got rocks and, and tundra. They're really great. And in particular, if you, if you drive them carefully, you don't have much of an impact at all. I mean, we don't, we don't hoon around in them, uh, pulling wheelies and making donuts and things like that. You know, we're just traveling a lot of very sensitive science gear. So we love those quads. They're very, very great. Very low ground pressure with the big fat tires. They carry a lot of gear to a lot of, of tricky places that's for sure yeah we do use snowshoes depends where we are uh, because we're using all of this coat everywhere i personally like to use skis because i find them just a little bit more efficient and a bit faster but then we're always running into those conditions where you know boots certainly won't work skis aren't working so we put them snowshoes on and we can travel got that high flotation they're light to carry on the rucksack so it's no big deal if you don't need them and with a pair of snowshoes and some ski poles, you can make travel very easy. So yeah, great question. Thank you. All right. Before I wrap up today, I want to share one more link here. This is the link to the Pristine Seas page on National Geographic. And Paul and, his, and the whole team are doing incredible work all over the world, getting these last wild places uh, in our ocean protected. And I think, Paul, you just came back a uh, recent expedition to the Southern Line Islands. Yeah, I did. I'm, I'm fresh back from the Southern Line Islands, which is in Kiribati, Central Pacific, it was a very key expedition. And thanks for mentioning it, Joe, because we were there 12 years ago and discovered it as a beautiful, pristine area. Um, the Kiribati government protected it. And then it was great to go back in 12 years later and see that protection really has made that coral reef completely resilient because other parts of the world's coral reefs have suffered from climate change. But because this one was protected, it's been amazing in regenerating from the hot water event. So a very key expedition. Thank you. All right. Well, shout out to all the classrooms that joined us via YouTube. Thanks for playing Kahoot with us and sending in all your great questions. A huge shout out to our camera classroom. So uh, some classrooms joined virtually because of uh, online schooling with COVID and a few join us on camera. So I'll pop them in there to give us a big wave to our classrooms in Maine and Texas. <laughs> All right. And Paul, obviously a huge thank you to you. It's always great to spend some time and have you share your stories and adventures with classrooms. Uh, great seeing you. And yeah, we can't wait till next time. Thank you, Joe, for having me on. And thank you, everybody, for sharing some time with me so I can tell my stories. I've really enjoyed it. Have fun in the polar regions. and I, I'll be checking back in my questions and I'll come back straight away, as Joe says. So thanks, everybody. Have a brilliant day. I see Miss Krinsky joined as well. Maybe her classroom wants to do a shout out. There they are. Thanks for joining us today, Ms. Krinsky. Hi. 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 Thank you so much. Hi. 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 All right. Have a great rest of the day, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much.